record. Hello, and welcome to the Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Dr. Atia Nagra. Atia, are you ready to be great today? Yeah. Dr. Adia Nagrath is a visionary leader on a mission to change the way that the world teaches mathematics. He co-founded Elephant Learning Math Academy, which is a gamification of a proven curriculum. On average, children in Elephant Learning learn 1.5 years of math in 10 weeks using this system, using only 30 minutes per week. At the age of 14, he taught himself C++ and continued to, on to read books on game development and neural networks which are the basis for modern day AI. He graduated from the University of Denver with a dual major of math and computer science, continuing on to graduate school, continuing on to graduate school while working full time as a software developer to graduate with a PhD in math and computer science seven years later. That's a very um, noteworthy accomplishment right there. Thank you. <laughs> so how hard was that to do it? I mean, I mean, this one, one is, is, is hard enough, I would say, but two of them like, Are you talking about the PhD? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the, the degree was in mathematics and computer science. The focus was in mathematics, though. I had a very strong computer science background. So what's wrong the way the world teaches children math right now? Like, why do you want to change the way the world teaches children math? Well, um, so what we found out was that... Uh, many students are actually behind. So on average, children are about two years behind in mathematics. Um, and it's, it's actually a long income line. So the lowest 20% of income earners are on average three years behind uh, their funded peers. Uh, it's only the top 20% that kind of um, come in prepared for kindergarten. And, um, and because of that, their students do well in our education system. So what we found out was basically that if we could fill this gap of understanding so that the student can understand the teacher, then they can participate in our education system and, and come out just like the top 20% income earners. So is there a correlation between being able to learn math and success later on in life? Yeah, it, it actually becomes the cycle, right? So... Um, what we know is that like eighth grade math scores predict whether you drop out of high school and it tends to be again in low income neighborhoods where the math scores are not that great. And so then it leads to not completing high school, which then also leads to the lifetime wages being capped. So, um, yeah, it becomes this, it, it, this is what we believe is feeding the cycle of poverty. If we can educate our students to um, get to the university level and then participate in STEM majors or business majors, um, then they can come out and, and, and contribute at that level, which would be amazing. But more than that, we would have uh, politicians and business people that understand the same language that the scientists and mathematicians are speaking. One thing with math, it seems like, you know, if you don't get the basis down, you're pretty much lost forever right like you don't you can't figure out the basics like you can't figure out pre-algebra the odds of you being able to add to one up or two are like pretty low correct well so math builds on top of itself and the best way to think about it is like a jargon so like in hr you guys got a lot of jargon which if you started busting out for me today i i wouldn't understand what you're saying right and then on top of that, human beings build ideas on top of other ideas. The best example is addition to multiplication. If you don't understand addition, it's very unlikely you're going to understand what multiplication is. Now, as adults, we think about it, we look down and we think about it and we say, well, it's just multiplication, right? And for most people, that means memorizing your multiplication tables. But what we see is that students struggle with word problems. And what that actually means then is that um, they're not able to think to use multiplication to solve a, a real life problem that's being described in words. And so they're not able to apply the concept and it's most likely because they don't understand the concept. So for example, we were at a chili festival kind of early on when we first got started and uh, we had these computers set up at different levels and we had this student come up and she says, oh, I'm in multiplication. And 
So we put her on the multiplication computer and four groups of five objects came up. So it was groups of fives, but four of them. And I watched and she counted all 20 to get the answer. And then I asked her, well, what's four times five? And she quickly said 20. So what happens here is that she's memorized the multiplication table. She knows immediately four times five is 20, but she doesn't know that multiplication can be used to solve this problem. Now, by asking her that, I connected the two together because she just counted to 20 and she realized it was 20. So like, that's an instantaneous connection for her. Multiplication is now useful to her to solve real life problems. But 75% of our children are not there. How important is a teacher in, in teaching math? Like, you know, suppose we have a teacher right out of college, first year teaching, you know, elementary school math. And the other teacher is like, you know, been teaching for 20 years, right? Does a teacher make that much of a difference? I mean, because what, four plus four is always eight, right? Does it really matter what concept the teacher uses or does it make a big difference? Well, so this is what we're talking about, right? So like four plus four is eight, true. Give me four things, give me four more things. That's the idea behind four plus four is eight, right? And if the student hasn't connected that, then it, it's really challenging. And to be a teacher in this situation is actually also extremely challenging. I mean, it's not uncommon for teachers to have the attitude, and it's not, not that they're doing anything wrong, but it's not uncommon for teachers to have the attitude that if I failed them in first grade because of mathematics, what's that going to do to their self-esteem and their confidence? The issue is, though, that the confidence ends up suffering regardless because they end up in mathematics that they don't understand because they didn't understand the previous year. So now as a teacher walking into third grade, you have students all over the board. You have students that are three years behind, two years behind, one year behind, completely on track, maybe ahead. So there's only a small sliver of the class that you're lecturing to that actually gets it. And the rest are pretending, right? They, they believe they belong there. They believe they have to perform. They're using whatever tools they have necessary to try to perform. But in reality, it's a torture because they don't understand the idea. And honestly, the idea is not that hard. We have research that shows that four-year-olds can understand, uh, sorry, we have research that says four-year-olds exhibit division during play. And it's the adults in the room that don't think they'll understand it. They don't label it. But we have four-year-olds in our system that are doing fractions. I think, for example, the children like, can I, understand it. I think, for example, I, I, I did 25 years of Army, and my kids that like, went to seven, seven schools in the 12 years, right? And each, each school district had a different standards, different teaching methods. I mean, different everything, right? And it was just a challenge, right? I mean, math was always the subject we had to focus on, right? Yeah. And, and that makes it even more challenging when you move and, and then maybe they start at a different level. Uh, or if, if um, we've had parents come in, say, well, I went to the hospital, so I wasn't able to drive my child to school for two months. She was doing fine, now she's behind. Um, I've had parents come in and say, I've got a 12 year old that is testing at the third grade level. There's gotta be something you can do, please help me. And you've taken those students and we've recovered them because we're working on exactly what math is. It's the language that's important. If we can get the children to understand the ideas behind the mathematics, the procedures, right? They, they understand why the procedure is there, why it works, because they have in their mind what's happening. And this is an extreme example, but suppose you have a kid in the third grade, or we'll say the eighth grade when they, you know, the, all the math tests start, you know, eighth grade, both parents have PhDs in math, right? Obviously, they're going to like do really well, you know? And another parent, other kid, eighth grade, has a single parent, and that parent has like a GED, right? I mean, just... So your, your program can help out the, the kid with the, with the GED parent, correct? Yeah, yeah. And, and so this is what we found, because you got to remember, we only cover through algebra right now. Our goal is to cover through calculus one day. And what our hope is, is that we could take a student at university right now struggling at whatever major they're in um, and, and get them that understanding so that they can now understand the professor, whether it's business, whether it's physics, whether it's chemistry, right? If we can do that, then we've made college useful for them, right? And that's, that would be a great goal. Um, 
but covering through algebra, we tell the parent how uh, we intend to teach it and what the idea is, and the parent can try it out on their own. And um, and and to be honest with you, uh, most most parents are very successful. Maybe we have some problems once we get to some of the upper level subjects like algebra. Uh, but our customer success is there to help you, meaning that if you message in, if you screenshot the question and you don't know what to tell your student, we will help you tell your student something so that they can overcome the issue and keep going. So there are people in the world are natural athletes, people are natural singers, natural, you know, with the case would be, is there such a thing as a person who's natural doing math? Well, so honestly, uh, I, I think I disagree with the premise. <laughs> okay. So, uh, this, this is, this is what I think. And I mean, obviously there's some counter examples out there, like Mozart's supposed to have been able to play the piano just looking at it. But honestly, I believe that every person is the sum of the experiences that they've had up to that point in time. And just the things that people have had experiences in vary so greatly, right? Like, I got a PhD in mathematics, which means I had a lot of mathematical experiences for that period of seven or eight years. And I had to put thought into problem solving for that. Um, and I think that basically, if you look at someone who's a natural singer, well, probably when they were young, they were singing. Yeah. That's very true. Um, so on, on LinkedIn, you did a LinkedIn article on June 1st on your LinkedIn profile that talks some about the, how medical complications and medical challenges uh, affect the learning. How, can you talk about that article some? Yeah, sure. And I, I think the marketing team put the article out, but like, uh, again, we've had parents message in saying things like, um, you know, my student has gone to the hospital for whatever reason, or I've gone to the hospital for whatever reason, they've missed school. We've helped those students catch up. We've had parents come in that tell us that their child is autistic and they've experienced success or learning impairments such as ADHD or dyslexia or dyscalculia. And I mean, here's the thing, right? Is that I, this, is how I, this is how I describe it to people. I say, it's like if you or I were to walk into a third year biochem course, right? We wouldn't be able to understand the professor even though he's speaking English because we missed the first two years of jargon that came before that. So if you can put yourself in that position and then imagine yourself in the third grade with that, with that disposition, um, what that's got to feel like is that they're being asked to memorize arbitrary facts. Four times three is 12. I don't know what it means, but okay. <laughs> if you say so. Right. And, um, and, and and the thing is, is that you can walk out of the biochemistry course, but you can't walk out of the third grade. And I don't know what you do, but like, if I'm in another country and I'm with some people from that country and they start, start going off in Spanish or Russian or whatever, I tend to check out. <laughs> and I got to imagine a lot of the students are checking out of math time in the classroom. And how many times do we say, oh, well, you're not, being able, you're not able to pay attention in class, so that's a problem. Well, now maybe we go and ask if there's an ADHD diagnosis. And I mean, let's be honest, the, they're motivated to diagnose this. They're, they're motivated to put a pill out for this. But in reality, attention span is something that's 100% trainable. And as adults, we know that. I mean, that's what meditation is. For the um, for class size, is there a, a a recommended class size for math? Like, I, I have to guess if there's a class of forty people, it's gonna be hard to te teach for math. Is like, what's the perfect class size? Obviously, one on one is perfect, right? But is like an optimal class size? Well, what we try to focus on is getting the teacher the information on what the students understand, so that they can break them into the correct cohorts. If you have a classroom of two hundred people where everyone in that classroom is at the same level of understanding for the, for the language that you're about to start using, then all 200 would theoretically be able to learn. And 
um, I think that's what our system proves, right? Because we go and meet the child at their level and then we start building them up. And, and most of the students are getting over the hurdle. Talk to us a little about the fear of failure in learning math. I mean, I think if you've all been in a classroom before and you know, you're like, please teach it. You're like, please, please don't call on me. Please don't call on me, you know, cause you might know the answer, but you think you're gonna talk funny or do it wrong and everyone's gonna make fun of you. How do you get kids to come overcome that? So the fear, the fear is, the fear is that I don't understand. The fear is I'm not being authentic. Um, and what we do is we add the understanding. So we're kind of the medicine that will fix the anxiety around mathematics. But the key is, is if we can get students to be authentic and say, well, I don't understand what's going on here, then they would be able to get the help in the classroom that they need, um, potentially, depending on what school district they're in and et cetera. But, um, but yeah, I think that, that, I mean, part of the problem is, is that if they got passed on, even though they didn't understand, they're kind of in a situation where they're expected to understand. And that's, that's a pretty scary situation. So in the United States, we have like literally hundreds, if not thousands of different school districts and all of them have like different standards, right? How does that help or hurt the, the, you know, teaching kids math, all these different standards across the nation? Well, honestly, um, I mean, they're, they're all right, the standards. I mean, it is what it is, right? The, they, they want some sort of a measure to see if a student got to a certain point. And um, from a perspective of organization and, and trying to achieve it, I mean, you, you have to have something like that. And I think that, um, that what Common Core was trying to do was it was trying to get students to, um, or, or teachers to focus on the understanding, right? So it was trying to get some sort of a standard around, well, can we test that the student understands? But at the end of the day, the systemic issue tends to be that the rewards for the teachers and the administrators is around the math scores. And so it's always to shortcut the system still and see how can we get the student to pass the test. So even with the word problems, what happens is that the teachers provide mnemonics on how to solve them, which are useful at the moment because, for example, if you're in the third grade and you're learning multiplication and all of the word problems around are around multiplication and there's only two numbers in every word problem, right? You're going to like, guys, just multiply, right? Like you're going to get them to pass the test because I mean, your salary is dependent on it. Yes. And so your, your platform teaches up to algebra, correct? Through algebra. Um, and what, what age demographic are you going after? Is like from like two years old to 16 or how's that work for you? We're writing from ages two to 16. Uh, we may change it to two plus. The real thing is this. Um, and it's a really, I mean, it, it is a situation. It is what it is. Um, at the university level, even at the high school level, I mean, we, we seen it. I was a GTA for seven years. Most of the time, if I got a student that can't understand in either calculus or statistics, there's a misconception that originated in algebra or earlier. So algebra is considered middle school mathematics, but honestly, it's high school mathematics. It's algebra one, algebra two, geometry, which is algebra with shapes, and then trigonometry, which is functions, which is algebra, but with cyclical functions. And so like basically students are taking four years of algebra and the school's philosophy, and it's no one's fault again, right? This is just how human beings have taught mathematics for so many generations, but it is, let's just keep giving it to the student until they get it, right? Until they think about it and get it finally, right? Let's just repeat it. So like one entire year of addition, let's add, let's add with money, let's add on the clock, let's add with 
right? But in the end, if what we do is we help the student understand exactly what addition is, then the rest of those curriculum items come fairly easily. So, um, so really, I guess to answer the question, if you have a student that's struggling in high school mathematics or even at the university level, our system could start to fill those misconceptions for them and start to get them understanding that, you know, would give the professor some baseline to be able to get them to go. Because I'll be honest with you, like I was in that situation where I was the GTA and a student comes in and says, I don't understand why I'm subtracting five from both sides. And that feels like an impossible situation. I remember I, I took algebra one as a junior in high school and I struggled, but all my kids took it algebra one like an eighth grade, right? I'm like, wait, what's going on here, right? When did the high school math become, you know, junior high math, right? Yeah, I don't know. When I took algebra, I think I was in the seventh grade. Um, so why, why is the math important to being, why is knowing math and learning math, at least having a work on knowledge of math, important to having a successful career and a successful life after, after school? That's a great question. So the one thing that we have in the research that's very interesting is that preschool mathematics predicts third grade reading scores better than preschool reading scores. And then preschool mathematics were also a better predictor of fifth grade overall scores, meaning it wasn't just math affected, it was all subjects. So there's several reasons why this might happen. The first reason is that, you know, like when a child is learning to count um, and they have to start sliding over a certain number of things, like give me 10 things and they slide over 10 and stop on 10 they have to be able to hold the 10 in their head and then remember to stop on 10 when they get there, which is kind of like chewing gum and walking for the first time. So there's a lot of things going on with mathematics where you're exercising the brain from a perspective of problem solving, from a perspective of short, uh, usable memory, uh, attention span, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and so that might play a role in it, but I think another reason is, is that we do have as a society, um, this, this kind of sentiment towards mathematics where it's like, well, I'm just not a numbers person. And as soon as it's okay to not be a numbers person, well, then maybe you're not a history person either. And maybe you're not a social studies person either. And I don't like Jim that much. I'll be honest, <laughs> like, but you see what I'm saying now, the situation doesn't get better right now we're undergoing the technological revolution, right? So like there was a, um, uh, in, in the 1800s, the industrial, revolutional, industrial revolution, right now is what is the technological revolution? And the thing is with the technological revolution is it's all built on mathematics. Computers are mathematics. Uh, parents say, I want my children to learn how to code. Well, if you don't understand algebra, you're not coding. That's the language of the computer is algebra. And so um, it, it, even if you're not looking to go into one of those fields, it doesn't get much better. Almost everything requires mathematics. Construction requires at least a, a good understanding of fractions, uh, decimals and percentages, because you gotta take all the measurements and you gotta be able to put all that stuff together. So all of your trades even, uh, have to have some some basic amount. Uh, but from there, business is typically where people would go. Um, and the thing is, is that because the world is so data driven now, statistics has become extremely important for the professors to teach the concepts of business. Uh, so it's different than even when I went there, it, it, like when I graduated in 2008. And, um, and that's the challenging thing is that most of our students are realizing that too late, they're getting there and then they're finding out that they're, that this is more math than I wanted to do. And then they're switching to humanities. So the humanity majors uh, tend to cap out on salary around 40 K a year. And so we have a generation of students that we promised, we said, Hey, you can grow up to be anything you want. And then they got to the end of that line and they found out that wasn't true. And not only was that not true, I'm paying to go to college. I'm taking out loans to go to college. And even when I come out, 
I'm not going to have that high paying paycheck that I thought I was going to have. I know even with HR, there's a lot of HR people tell you, like, you know, I'm not a numbers person. I'm not a data person. And I always say, well, you're not an HR person, right? Because you got to do analytics. You got to do research. I mean, numbers are definitely big, big in the HR field, at least from our point of view. A lot of people agree with me. Yeah, so, it's everywhere. It's, it's what makes it measurable, right? So like when you read the business books, they say you need to have smart goals. Well, the M in smart is measurable. Mm -hmm. So as soon as, as soon as you move to measurable, you see the people who got it and who didn't get it quickly because sometimes they throw out a number or they throw out a measurement and you're like, well, you're not going to get traction with that measurement. You need to measure the actual output. And then that way we know what, how, how, how to grow you. Right. So who's your target customer? Is it parents, school districts or something else for your platform? Yeah. Um, we, we mainly sell to parents. Um, the idea was that, um, it, it's hard to go to the schools because of all the competition there. Um, I basically thought about it and said, I have no relationships in, in education. Uh, my co-founder didn't have any relationships in education. So I said, well, that's kind of a dead end because if I'm cold emailing people and they're getting a thousand cold emails a day, they're not opening mine. Um, so we thought, you know what? This is important. This is something that we think would change the world. We think that we could break the cycle of poverty if we could get everyone up to the level. And we think that the effects of having a more educated society is that we solve the problems that are facing this world, like climate change or, right? I mean, more engineers, more scientists, more physicists. We'll get our head around this problem. I, I'm sure of it, right? So we thought that, yeah, this is important enough for a child's future that if we go to the parent with this story, they'll pick it up. And it turns out they already knew. We didn't have to tell them any of this. Change the subject just a little bit. Can you talk about the importance of public speaking and being able to public speak? Yeah. Um, maybe you can explain the question a little bit. I mean, just the importance of being able to get in front of a crowd and, and talk in front of people, convince them to do what you oh. want them to do. Yeah, I mean, public speaking is pretty important. And I think, uh, especially when you're working on uh, a PhD, you have to do that. You have to go and present your research. And in fact, your final dissertation is you need to be able to stand up in, in front of a panel of experts and, and defend your research. And I think that uh, from a very young age, I mean, I, I've been kind of lucky in getting into uh, forensic speech and debate, uh, extemporary speaking, uh, things of that nature. And it offered a lot of skills, like being able to think quickly on my feet and being able to, uh, again, speak in front of people. And uh, it's just, it's just a wonderful skill to have. So I mean, I think anything where you are extending your boundaries on your comfort zone, and and learning i think in the end is good for you so when you do your dissertation it, it is, i know that you find a group of people do you have a, like a are you presenting slides or just you just basically talking and, and defending your dissertation or do you have like slides and you know stuff like that how's that work yeah i think i i prepared something and then and then they and then you present it to uh i presented to i think the entire department they, they invited everyone in, the graduate students and whoever wanted to attend. And then um, everyone exited the room and then it was just the, the, I can't remember their names, the moderators, right? But the judges or they got a special name for it at that level. <laughs> and um, <laughs> they're all professors in mathematics from around the world. And then they, they ask you questions about what you presented and, 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 I mean, they've read the dissertation at that point, so they have a set of questions they've prepared. So let's say there's someone out there who has a master's degree and the thing about getting a PhD, what advice would you have for them? 
Mm. Well, I mean, you just have to do it, really. I mean, the, I think the big thing is, is just this, and everyone actually experiences this in their life at some point, at least, at least the people around me I, I know, in, like the entrepreneurs. And it's that at some point you've reached the edge of human knowledge. So like the difference between the masters and the PhD is that it's at some point you reach the edge and then to get the PhD, you have to then contribute to the edge of human knowledge in whatever subject you're working on. And so you have to actually then go and publish papers that are third party reviewed and et cetera, that they look at and, and, and they agree is a significant enough contribution. And to be honest with you, I've found that in like my EO forums where, you know, you have some guy who's a marketer or he's, uh, he's really good at getting VC or he's really good at, um, whatever. And, and then they get to a place where they're trying to do something that no one's ever done before. Right. So there's no mentor they can go speak to, to get the advice on how, on how to make that happen, on how to get that done. And, and then at that point, the creativity kicks in and we solve the problem. And I think every human being has the capacity to do it. It's just that you have to have the want. So if that's what you want to do, you got to commit and do it. And speaking of the limit of human knowledge, I, I remember, I'm pretty sure this is true. At least I remember it's true. Like back in the 1890s, the guy in charge of the U.S. Patent Office wanted to close the U.S. Patent Office because all everything that can be found invented had been already invented, right? This is back in 1890, right? So how has having a PhD helped you with your startup? Well, I mean, again, I think that a human being is the sum of the experiences they've had to this point in time. I think that, you know, being able to walk into these other fields and start to learn them like marketing or, um, I mean, really just any, any of these like customer success, et cetera. I think that some of the things, some of the experiences that I had that were mathematical were then able to be used to, to do some of the things here. But to be honest with you, I mean, it's been a while since I, I tried to value the thing. And the last time I tried to value it, I didn't have much to it. I mean, it adds credibility. Uh, clearly, it means something, though it's hard to tell where at any given point in time you're using something. And was it an experience from graduate school or was it an experience from high school or was it an experience from a bachelor's degree? So I can't take away anything that I am at this point in time and say that will I, will I perform at the level that I'm performing now? It's extremely challenging to say, right? So I think that if you're curious and if you love it and you want to learn it, then you should go and learn it. And if it's something you're doing to try to further your career and you don't want to learn it and you don't love it, you, you shouldn't do it. So you already talked about this some a little bit, but can you talk about your entrepreneurial journey, like why get into startups? Because I'm pretty sure most people with PhDs in like math and computer science don't get into startups. Why, why the startup journey? Why the entrepreneurial journey? Well, so, I mean, I started the way most entrepreneurs start with the services business. So when I came out of uh, college, I, uh, I said, well, let me go try to be a software developer. And the next thing I know is that I'm, a, I'm an independent contractor uh, as a software developer. And I'm telling the client, you know what, why don't I pick up some people to help me out? And so the next thing I know is uh, it's two years later and I've got a firm with 30 engineers, um, not 30, 10 engineers, 30 people total. And, and, and we're working for some heavy duty clients and I got some real money coming in. So at that point, you know, like it went from being a gig to, okay, I'm going to have to make this real. Um, and that was, gosh, eight years ago now. So elephant learning isn't the first business, it's the second business. And, and, and at some point, uh, you know, 
coming out of the first business, I had to sit down and figure out what do I want to do with my life? What do I want out of my business? What do I want out of, you know, just everything that's there. And I think that's how I ended up where I am today. And I think the why was probably survival. So for your own company, you, you talk about this some too, but can you talk about how the, how your company came about, like why you got started and what's your vision for your company? Sure. So the, the mission, the vision is, is can we change the way the world teaches mathematics? If we can get more people to think about mathematics the way we're thinking about mathematics, then they should also be having the success that we're having. And, and then I can achieve that, that vision of, well, what if most people were proficient at mathematics instead of most people not being proficient at mathematics? And we can achieve what the world looks like at that point in time. So the way we decide to achieve that vision is we apply the mission, empower children with mathematics. So can we empower children with mathematics through the parent? Can we empower children with mathematics through the teacher or a tutor or a learning center? And the way I view it is through tools, meaning that like software is actually a tool um, that people use to accomplish a goal. And, so our tool is the software platform that is delivering the questions and we're able to now with great certainty test the student understand their level of knowledge and build them up and um and then basically what we did was we said well if that's the mission and we can get everyone in our company to be effective in their role at empowering children with mathematics then we should be able to achieve that mission. So like at the end of the day, the goal actually is that I could have an organization that's out in space, that's doing the good, empowering the children with mathematics, that is collecting revenue and also potentially profitable and is not an entity that is dependent upon me because then it's real. Then it becomes kind of like Disney where it transcends Walt Disney and it's out in the world and it's doing that good. And because that good motivation is there, right? The cycle just keeps spinning. So we empower children with mathematics. It brings in money. We use the money to empower children with mathematics. I mean, it would just be amazing if we can create that. And there's a lot of companies that are actually already doing that. So we're actually just inspired by them. And are you currently just in the United States right now? You're in different countries. So right now, uh, we, we're advertising the United States only. We have opened it up to people in other countries. We've advertised UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Ireland, places where people speak English. We opened it up to all of Europe during COVID-19 and all of Asia. I mean, we just, and you got to remember, this is just us telling people that we're out there because this is all done online. So anywhere in the world where you have an internet connection, you'd be able to access it. Yes. Next, can you talk about why HR is important to business? Yeah, I mean, finding the right people is probably one of the most important thing. Um, right people, right seat. They get it, want it, can do it. If you have people like that, then the business will likely be successful as long as you're moving in the right direction. And most of the time, people are. And if you don't have the right people in the right seats, then it tends to be a struggle. It tends to be honestly a business maybe that you don't even want to be in. For, for math, mathematicians, is it important for them to be people person also? Well, I think everyone is people, people, <laughs> but like, I think that, um, yeah, certain professions lend themselves better to, to working with people like, when you're working with computers a lot, you're not interacting with people. The way you interact with the computer is way more directly. And some people don't like direct communication. Some people are 100% okay with it. So I think the interactions just, they have to be conscious. Yes. Can you share your social media for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Yeah, absolutely. So if you're looking for us on LinkedIn or Facebook, Elephant Learning's there. We have a YouTube channel. We don't have many videos there yet. We're still kind of building a team around marketing. 
and um, you can find us there, Elephant Learning app on Facebook, Elephant Learning on LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn if you want to connect with me. But the preferred place to go to learn more about Elephant Learning is the website and uh, also the Facebook page. And for our listeners, we'll have the links to all the social media on our blog, still the show notes on our blog, and you know, that's at www.cabinetshlblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with all your friends and your network. So we'll come to the end of our talk. Can you give us any advice on wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I had a conversation with someone the other day on a podcast and uh, it was about a context for disempowerment. So uh, a context for disempowerment is the idea that I can't do something. And the reality is, is that I believe human beings can achieve anything that they want if they adapt to the situation and they take the opportunities that are presented to them. And so it's important to identify where you're creating contexts of disempowerment in your life. And I mean, it's something at Elephant Learning now that we're kind of working on actively because our mission is to empower. And if there's a context for disempowerment, then it's very challenging to be empowering. Thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. I, I had a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. And to our listeners, thanks for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.